about conspiracy theories, because I know you've been fascinated by yes, that recently. it's my, fir- my third article in a row on conspiracy theories, because I've, I've got a lot of, I've got friends on Facebook who, mm-hmm. who have sort of been drawn in, and, I, and I've started to feel badly about how much I've been sort of troubling these people, or even, <laughs> even shaming them for their ideas, because they're, I find them to be quite ridiculous. Um, but... There's some emotional truth in it all, and that's what I sort of mm-hmm. discovered. Is like, wait a minute. There's something quite profoundly honest about this. I feel these same underlying threads of distrust of the establishment mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. wanting a, a major shift to happen. Like, I feel like most of us are feeling mm-hmm. these same feelings, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. these people simply are are coming up with a storyline that that. Mm-hmm. Sort of pa- wraps it all up in a beautiful package, and I, I wanted. Mm-hmm. To, uh, let me share with you just a few highlights of this conspiracy theory that was sent okay. to me, mm-hmm. which it basically all boils down to the. It ties in a whole bunch of evil people together, mm-hmm. and you've got this this theory that King John the Third is the rightful heir to the throne of England, and that the the whole royal British family they're all illegitimate because the Rothschilds. Um, were always fathering their children. Mm-hmm. So they're not actually fathered by the royal family. So all of them are illegitimate. Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth. Devil spawn. Yeah. And so they're, they're, they're <laughs> basically there's a, there's a video and this, and this whole long document without any sources cited basically saying this is how it is. Mm-hmm. And, and Donald Trump is, 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 uh, recognizes the, the legal, you know, sanctity of this, and that he's mm-hmm. he's supporting this transition of power, and that this King John the Third, once he has all of his his right rightful money and property, he'll mm-hmm. be the most powerful man in the world, and he will save us all from all of these corrupt people, mm-hmm. the Clintons and the and and Obama, and oh, and there was an interesting like family chart where they tied like Obama's mother and. The Clintons and Harvey Weinstein, who has nothing to do with this, but Lord. apparently he's part of the same like evil bloodline mm-hmm. of all of these evil conspiratory people who are are basically behind all the mischief in the world, and they're all, of course, mm-hmm. like Epstein. They're all they're all pedophiles, you know, doing yeah. the, the the most evil of things. And King John the Third is going to save us all from this wow. disgusting evil. Well, it's it sounds like a fabulous story. Yeah. I mean, really a great story. It's got so much stuff. It's like a Hollywood script. Right. It's got the kitchen sink, everything, and the kitchen sink <laughs> thrown in. I mean, it, it reminds me of a lot of those theories that the great Russian dynasty had not actually all been murdered, that, you know, the youngest daughter had escaped and was living in Brooklyn waiting to be discovered. Um but I'll have to tell you, I mean, the Rothschilds theory, that conspiracy theory has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Right. Ever since the Jews became the great bankers of Europe, the conspiracy theories around them and their so-called dark role in history has just been prevalent. Right. Which is very mm-hmm. unfortunate. But the fact that they're trying to tie everybody into the bloodline suggests something even more ancient, doesn't it? Yeah. That whole idea that there is some bloodline which carries the evil and another bloodline which carries the good. So it's almost like blood sacrifice. It's primitive. It is primitive stuff. Mm -hmm. And what feels, I mean, we can laugh about it, but what feels alarming is when people talk about this as if they really believed it. It it makes you feel like the ground isn't quite steady. Because we we feel that most people buy into a shared consensus reality. And when there are people who won't 
share that consensus, who stand outside it and attack it, it makes us very nervous. And it, and it, and, and so they call people sheeple, and they say, "Oh, you're just buying into all the all mm-hmm. the mass media. It's all." crazy BS and, and mm-hmm. you're, you've bought into it hook, line, and sinker. You're believing just what they want you to believe. You mm-hmm. know, you're not really mm-hmm. thinking. You're not questioning. If you're not questioning reality to the degree we are, you're not really awake. Mm-hmm. And I, it's funny because I pride myself on always working on being awake. Mm-hmm. I always am chan- challenging my own paradigm mm-hmm. and, and looking for a bigger picture. And, and yet, mm-hmm. when I look at them, you know, framing the entire, the entire industry of journalism people who who make a living by being by telling mm-hmm. the truth and and uncovering mm-hmm. big secrets mm-hmm. the idea that they would all not they, that all of them would be paid mm-hmm. off somehow or in in cahoots with the conspiracy and not do what there there is their very top mm-hmm. dream in life mm-hmm. to do just seems ludicrous mm-hmm. you know like how many thousands of people would have to be in on this for this to be a legitimate right story and how how long would it take for that story to be actually broken legitimately mm-hmm, with actual mm-hmm. evidence and not just hearsay right the chain of unlikely circumstances becomes so incredibly perverse that one really can't imagine all of those concoctions standing up under scrutiny right you know you can't have that many people being duplicitous without somebody getting suspicious. But it got and the entire British monarchy? Right. Oh, they're all evil and the, Cl- <laughs> the Clintons and Obama. I mean, they're they're basically siblings, you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> Weinstein, wow, wow. Yeah. like every so what's yeah. interesting to me is like everything evil gets tied together. Everything that's mm-hmm. dark and disgusting mm-hmm. to us. We're going to pool all of that together. And here's my theory is just that the this is really a desire for someone else to solve all of our problems. So it's a Messiah wish, yeah. essentially. Well, that's the bright yeah. side of the coin. The dark side of the coin is that it's, it's a scapegoat mechanism, right? Because the two of those go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. If you've broken the world into good and evil, and it's and the tension is too great that you can't hold it inside of yourself. The psychological response is to project both things outside of yourself to relieve that unbearable tension. So that's when you find someone yeah. who'll carry the role of the Messiah Redeemer and someone else to carry the role of the scapegoat, the villain. And you can look at this through all of human history and mythology. This is basically what most mythologies are, the expression of humans projecting their gods and demons onto outer characters in the world because it's too much to take inside. So this is quite common. This, this is, is common very common. Mythological mentality that's yes. in the minds of everybody, essentially. We're, we're, mm-hmm. we're drawn to this. Some of us, mm-hmm. perhaps in a weaker state of mind or more exasperation uh, or just to have right. this proclivity to well, and let's, project. Well, let's take it down several notches so that you can understand the psychological um, template, Mm. if we can use that expression. This kind of glorification and denigration happens in every workplace. That the minute that you have, uh, say, a couple of people in contention for a a shared position or some plum corner office or what have you, there's a tension that's set up. And if both of them are going to remain in the office and work as colleagues, at some point they either have to address that tension, and that's difficult. Most people would avoid confrontation if they, if they could, especially if they have to live with it, right? This is your colleague. So what will usually happen is that they'll either look for someone above them who can help reconcile them by setting the tone or demanding a certain kind of obedience or camaraderie, or it goes the other direction. They look for some scapegoat, somebody they can both beat up on together. Mm-hmm. And this also is relieving because now, in a sense, they're projecting all of this negative energy onto a third party who was probably almost always someone lower on the totem pole, some innocent, unsuspecting, you know, schmuck who's going to get accused of anything that's going wrong and this is it it's like now you've got this 
the scapegoat basket and everything negative gets thrown into that guy's basket. Right. He's responsible. He's probably the one who's stealing food out of the office fridge, you know, leaving the toilet seat up, that uh, whatever people are irked about, he's probably the one. It's because it's emotionally more comfortable to, to, to have one scapegoat holding yeah. all of the darkness so that you don't have to deal with mm -hmm. any of the, uh, the rest of it. Yeah. But if you take it up, you know, to the notches that the conspiracy theorists are talking about, that's when you start religions or revolutions. Right? That's when your religious redeemer comes in in a whirlwind and overthrows the old gods in a fury and announces a whole new kingdom is at hand. A new dispensation to save you from the old sins. This is Moses leading the Hebrew people out of Egypt. And all of those bad things come raining down on the old Egyptian guard, right? All those plagues, because they're the bad guys. Right. And our good guys can march out and the waves will part for them and Moses will take us to the promised land. But it's, I mean, this conspiracy theory sounds every bit as Hollywood grandiose yeah. as, the, as that. Well, I was thinking of it, too, as, as, you know, similar to the story of Jesus, where it's like, it's mm -hmm. like you have a, you have this savior who's going to somehow mm -hmm. suffer through and relieve us of all, relieve us of mm -hmm. all of our responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of the, all of the atrocious things in the world. I mean, you so people literally saying, oh, George Floyd is still alive. He, he didn't, it was all a setup. Mm. It's like, oh, okay. So now yeah. racism and police brutality don't exist either. That's, that's part of the evil people's plot too. That's just a distraction technique. Oh, okay. <laughs> and, and, you know, wealthy inequality, like all, all of the things that we're dealing with, mm -hmm. the, the coronavirus, that's a scam. Like all these things that are very probable realistic things are essentially no the all responsible all responsibility lays in these evil the pans of these evil people these mm -hmm. evil disgusting people are behind all of it mm -hmm. and i guess w what's gripping me right now is the fact that they would once again turn to that very old old tired horse of the rothschild family because this is anti-semitism at its core. And the Jews have for centuries been the scapegoat of choice for the Western world. Yeah. Um, even before that, I mean, the way they were pushed around by all the bigger powers you know, before the, the Christians even arrive on the scene. And it's, it's, so, it's so ironic that they, they were they were pushed into being bankers in the first place because they weren't allowed to own property in Europe. Oh, right. For so long, I mean, it's like they, they had no choice but to. But to and Muslims and Christians were not allowed to charge interest if they made right. a loan. So it was. A, so it they was wouldn't. A, who would do that if you can't charge it? You only give loan money to your dirty, family. The dirty Jews they, can do it, right? <laughs> so they I mean, provide they, this very necessary service for the expansion of the Renaissance uh, right. system. Um, but it's it's so dangerous. It's because this is a sl such a slippery slope. We've been there so many times before and the really dark sad thing as we can see from our recent racial violence is that once someone has sort of got the mark of the martyr or the mark of the scapegoat it's very hard to erase it mm. like on school playgrounds when the bully is identified and the bully's victim it's very hard for the victim to climb out of that identity mm. it's like they're marked there, and even if a new bully comes in, they'll find that old target. It's like, you know, you got that big red zero on your forehead or something. Mm -hmm. So this is a dangerous place for people to go with their conspiracy theories. <laughs>the idea that Christianity in its own way was a conspiracy theory of redemption because you could easily read it that way. Here is a Jewish people who've been so downtrodden and so pushed around by every bigger group for thousands of years and now it's the Romans breathing down their neck and telling them when they can pray and when, you know, where they can build their temple. And they've been promised 
a messiah, redeemer. I mean, they haven't had a really powerful figure since King David, and they're really looking forward to this. But there's an important, an important way to see this. Now, coming from a Roman Catholic background, I was raised Irish Roman Catholic, the way you're supposed to interpret the journey of Christ through the crucifixion is that he is the one who takes away the sins of the world. That's absolutely out of scapegoat, right? He takes away the sins of the world. This was that ancient primitive ritual where you actually brought a goat into the village to relieve the village of its tensions. And you would come out and there'd be this big ritual and everybody would, you know, smear their dirt into the goat's hair or whatever. It is like that feeling of projecting physically all the dirt and nastiness. Um, and then you run it out of the village. And you get this temporary release, like, oh, good, now all the bad things are gone. So that's where that mentality comes from, that Jesus has come, he's taken on all of our sins, now he's crucified, he's dead, and he carries those sins away. Now we are washed clean. And that's really what we were supposed to believe. And so that meant that we were now obliged to worship him because he'd done so much for us. But if you really sit with that for any amount of time, and people have, you begin to get very uncomfortable because there's all sorts of passages in the Bible where it's very clear he did not think that he was doing anything for us. He was a teacher, and he kept saying, look, I'm trying to show you how to do this. I'm doing it. The power isn't in me. It's through God, so that means you can do it too. And I'm asking you to do it too, right? So this is very clear if you just read the book for yourself, that he's not wanting to be a scapegoat. That's not the big story here. There's a very important uh, French philosopher named René Girard who wrote really the definitive um, book on the scapegoat. And his theory about Christianity is that we've got it entirely upside down and backwards. That if you take seriously the teachings of Jesus Christ, he very specifically came to rid us of the idea of the scapegoat as a valid psychological method at either the individual or the collective level. Because he wanted you to see, if you're going to scapegoat me, what's going to happen? Heaven didn't imagine it magically appear on the earth, did it? There are still people dying. You still need to eat. It's a, no, you can't handle your problems that way. You can't shove them off onto somebody and malign him and, in this case, me, Jesus, and say that I'm some sort of demonic monster and feel that everything is going to go back to normal. This is a different teaching, and it's a higher teaching. It's a teaching that says you have to be willing to take this on yourself. You have to learn a new language of love and reciprocity and respect. You have to pull the divine and the demonic through yourself and reconcile them within yourself. And of course, nobody was ready to hear that. Nobody was ready, which is why you have an entire religion, Roman Catholicism, built on entirely the old idea. Oh good, a scapegoat, martyr, redeemer. Like we've always had. We like those myths. Those make it very easy. We can just bow down in obedience and worship and go on with our sacrifice as usual. I get it. I mean, it, it feels good to, to, to think that things are just going to be swept away and solved. I, in my article, I wrote about mm -hmm. what I call the, the, well, the, the, what's the, body, the body budget in the mm -hmm. brain is this glucose distributor that is very miserly with, a, with mm -hmm. all of the glucose. It doesn't want to give out much. And so the idea that we could you know, get away with, with a, you know, a lot of mm -hmm. things being swept off of our plate of responsibility by somebody else is just, it's, it's great. We love that idea. We would, mm -hmm. we would kill for that. <laughs> and we did. <laughs> <laughs> I was just reading about Johannes Kepler, the great astronomer, and how his mother Catherine was accused of witchcraft. And he spent like eight years gathering evidence to get her off. It was a very long trial, and they you know, kept delaying and delaying things because he had some standing. 
And what it looked like was that every bad thing that had happened in her town was now being laid at her feet as being her responsibility. So everyone who'd broken an arm, who'd lost their cow, whose child had been kidnapped in the woods, whose roosters got sick, whatever, it was all her fault. And he went through every single one of these dozens and dozens of charges and actually, like a detective, went and found out what had actually happened and was able in court to lay out moment by moment, everything that had happened, how she couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the cut child's kidnapping because at the time she was over here with that person who was this witness. I mean, he finally got his mother off, but it was an extraordinary witnessing of the mentality of, oh good, we've got a scapegoat. Here's something to put in the basket. You just do it without even thinking. You just want to get rid of it. You want someone to blame yeah, and the emotional, the emo- its really emotionally driven thing. I'm sure, and this is this feeling of of disgust. I mean, once you hate somebody, mm-hmm. ah, you just you kind of want to keep hating. You want to just keep mm-hmm. keep piling it on there because it makes you feel innocent. Ah, so now we're talking about the purity contamination yeah. conundrum for humans which has to be one of the strangest places to go. But you really have to. If you want to understand human behavior, and especially the uh, ancient rituals and mythologies, you have to get some glimmer of the power of the fear of contamination. Right? Why does a menstruating woman have to be carried on beds of leaves so that her feet don't touch the ground because if they do, everybody in the village will become sick and all the cattle will die. I mean, what? It's just so bizarre. But this terror, the fear of the, the leaky margins of the female body, all of these taboos around women and their menstruation and the childbirth and the afterbirth and the all of that is just so frightening. It's like they just can't deal with it. Mm. Uh, which is why women usually get saddled with all of those entries and exits into life because they all have to do with contaminating fluids. <laughs> mm. And women, you know, being already contaminated, we might as well let the women take care of it. We can see that in the current pandemic, right? 60, 70% of all the nurses and front end people taking care of the coronavirus victims are female. Um, So, yeah, so the purity, the desire not to be contaminated, I think is related to the scapegoat, right? Because once someone's been identified as the victim or the scapegoat, you don't want to have anything to do with them. No. Because you recognize they're in danger. I don't want to be anywhere near that. Yeah, because you are contaminated by association. You are. Uh, and the desire, therefore, to remain pure and apart from all of it is the opposite reaction, that somehow you can climb into a safe place and not have to feel any of those unpleasant right. things. This makes me think about racism yeah. immediately. This is, this is the white... Mm-hmm. Uh, the white defensiveness, if mm-hmm. you will, is to... You know, to not want to see all the evil mm-hmm. that's been done um, mm-hmm. by the hands of people who look mm-hmm. like me. Yeah, that. <clears throat> but of course, it 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 goes far deeper than that. I mean, it's not. It doesn't begin three hundred years ago. No. With the enslavement of the Africans, it's a very deep human fear of things that are different that are disabled, um, that are, well, to to put it in a nutshell, anything that reminds us of our vulnerability and mortality. I think that's really what's behind it. A reminder mm. that we too shall someday be forced down into that place where our utter vulnerability will be laid out. This is so dark that we, 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 we quarantine all of our elders in homeless shelters. I mean, I mean, in, in old, ho- old homes, old mm-hmm. homes, so that we don't have to see them in a way. Mm-hmm. It's another mm-hmm. another form of 
of getting getting the scary thing out, out, of, out, of, our out sight. of our sight. There's an extremely powerful African myth, which might be an appropriate story to tell. It's a coming of age story, and uh, I think you'll you'll see why it is. It's called um, the bead necklace. And in this particular village, the tradition was that a young woman during her childhood, her girlhood, would receive gifts of beautiful beads, and she would string these up, and each one represented some achievement or milestone in her young life. And when she had a complete necklace, it was a signal that she was ready for marriage, that she had now attained that status, and her accomplishments would make her a good wife. So your necklace was something you were very proud of as a young girl. So in this one village, there was a, a young girl who was targeted to be the scapegoat, the victim. And all the other girls would make fun of her and tease her. And one day they decided to play an especially cruel trick. And they, they went down to the river, and when they came back, they were not wearing their bead necklaces. And the, the girls said, where are your necklaces? And they said, oh, we've given them to River Mother because she's going to bless them and they'll come out even better than ever. So our girl ran down to the river, took off her necklace and flung it into the river and heard the laughter of the nasty girls behind her. And they came out from behind the rock and they all had their necklaces on. And she realized she had been tricked and had given away her most precious possession. And she was so broken hearted that she threw herself into the river. Down, down, down she went through the dark waters. When she came to the bottom of the river, she saw that she was in a whole world under the water. And she walked along until she came to River Mother, the wise old woman who lives under the waves. And River Mother said, Come to me, my child. But River Mother's hands and arms were old and gnarled and knotted, and there were sores and wounds that oozed pus. She was bruised and bloodied, and River Mother said, Come to me, girl. Lick my wounds. And the girl steadied herself, and she came to River Mother, and she embraced River Mother and licked her wounds and bound them up tenderly and cared for River Mother. And at the end of this, River Mother said, I have a gift for you. And she brought out the necklace, the bead necklace, and it was magnificent. Every bead gleamed more beautiful than it ever had, and right at the center was a brand new bead that was so beautiful, it just glowed with light. River Mother placed this around the girl's neck. The girl went out of River Mother's hut, and at that moment, the river monster came snorfling through, looking for food. I smell a girl! But River Mother put herself in front of the girl, no, you don't, she said. You smell nothing. And the girl was able to escape. She swam back up to the top. She climbed out of the river and ran back to the village. When she walked into the village with her new necklace, all of the other girls gathered around. They were filled with envy. Where did you get that necklace, they said. Well, she said, honestly, I threw my bead necklace into the river, and River Mother blessed it and gave it back to me. The other girls ran to the river. They all took off their necklaces and flung them in and jumped in after them. But when they came to River Mother, and River Mother said, Lick my wounds, they were disgusted. Oh, we won't, you horrible, hideous old hag! 
and they turned away from her and went back. And the river monster came snuffling through the waves, looking for dinner. And there was no river mother to protect them. And river monster ate them up. <laughs> well, there you have your coming of age story. <laughs> but if you think about it, coming of age is the time of menstruation, right? In these early tribes, that signaled that you were now ready to become sexually active and possibly enter into motherhoods anytime soon. So what would you need to know? What's the most important thing? You need to understand the power of facing the most dire of physical pain, wounding, bleeding, uh, the dangers of that, and be able to embrace it. Or you won't make a good mother. How can you possibly bring another human being into the world with all of that blood and pain and mess? You have to be ready for it. And so this was the test. If you can do that, if you can embrace your physical frailties, then you're really ready to become an adult. So it's a, p a powerful story. But in addition to being a coming-of-age story, it seems to me that its lesson is even greater because obviously it's not just for girl ch children. Obviously, male children would be put through their own coming-of-age paces, which always involves blood and danger and suffering and pain and the ability to come out of it, the other side, without running. But as adults in the Western world, we do not have any training that makes us look at human vulnerability in the face that way. Everything is kind of covered up and prettied up for us. We never see our young brothers and sisters being born in the bedroom. We don't see granny dying and being laid out in the kitchen, right? We don't, for the most part, war is no longer in our own streets. Right. It's somewhere very far away or sanitized on television. So we do not have the immediate experience of having to bear that and understand what it means ethically to really say yes to the vulnerability of being a human being. And I think that is what's behind all of these fears. Hmm. <clears throat> so we're, sh we're sheltered from, uh, from the darkness mm -hmm. so much in our lives that we mm -hmm. don't, that, that we don't mm -hmm. know that it's, we don't know it's reality. Right. And when we seem to glimpse bits of it, we want to just mm -hmm. keep them away from us. Right. I think that George Floyd was as moving, literally, it moved us out to the streets because it was right there. We, yeah. we couldn't turn away. We were seeing the vulnerability of being human right in front of us. And how quickly life is snuffed out by an uncaring, unfeeling other. Yeah, it was disgusting. <clears throat> right. And that's what we should be disgusted by, is brutality in the face of that vulnerability. But, as history shows us, brutality is often the reaction to vulnerability because it's so frightening that we would rather rise above the vulnerability by pretending that we are invulnerable, by grabbing the biggest weapon we can find and smashing that which has shown us how frail and fragile we really are. Right. And so when you're dealing with the, the other, the, this concept of, of project, projecting... Mm -hmm upon the other to to make you innocent and clean and mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know um how do you deal with that psychologically how do you really get into that um there was a very extraordinary exercise that i did once 
with a group at Mundelein College where we sat on the floor and I had picked some beautiful, sad cello music by Yo-Yo Ma. And the idea was that you simply sat facing another person in the class whom you may not have known very much at all. You simply sat and looked at them. You maintained eye contact for the duration of the cello piece, which was about seven, eight minutes. Turns out seven, eight minutes is a really, really, really long time to maintain eye contact. Mm -hmm. And people were tripping out over this. And all sorts of wild things were happening. I mean, the, the talk afterwards suggested that this was a truly powerful experience psychologically. Because people said things like, I kept falling into them because their eyes were so open, I kept falling in. It was like I couldn't tell who I was anymore and who they were because it was just the gaze was everything. Other people said the face started to morph and it, it looked like my father's face and then it looked like my grandfather's face and then it looked like my brother's face and then it turned into an animal and then into an angel and so there was something about this very simple act of sim of looking at another human being in the face full on that had a very powerful um, retrospective action that things kept coming back at you that made you understand the enormity of the human being that the, a single human face could become almost everything. It could become you. It could become the world. I did this little exercise not knowing what would happen because of a philosophy that had been created, and it's not well known, uh, an ethical philosophy by someone named Emmanuel Levinas who lived during um, the Holocaust and was in fact imprisoned in one of the concentration camps for a while and managed to come out. And his theory was that all of philosophy should begin with the ethics of the face. He said, in the human face is the foundation of all philosophy and all ethics because the naked human face in its vulnerability says, do not kill me for I am you. Very simple, very profound. But that was the idea. And it, if you've uh, ever read Martin Buber, I and Thou, Buber is a much more famous Jewish theologian. But he also had this feeling that if you could, instead of looking at people as, as it's, it, 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 right, the kind of marginalizing or clamping down the stereotyping, give them a name, give them a number. It diminished their humanity, their individuality. But if you could think of every person as a thou and bring them into your experience with that kind of honoring of the face-to-face, -face, of genuine mutuality and equality, you would discover a whole new way of being human. And it would grow, it would be an organic understanding of how to treat one another. This, it, you know, my favorite philosopher, Immanuel Kant, got to the same thing in a more abstract, roundabout way when he said that the ultimate uh, ethical consideration is that you must always treat the other as an end in themselves, not merely as a means to an end. That has you know, the same idea, that until you can see the actual humanity, that there's a whole world in this one human being, that you can read that in their face. That's where your ethics starts. So it's a very beautiful concept, but very hard, because the naked face is a very vulnerable position to be in, which is why lovers are so enamored of that, right? Because it's one of the few times, that and parenthood, where you're allowed that open gaze 
for minutes, if not hours, just gazing. And why in, in that kind of love or early parenthood, why do we feel that's so divine and so special? That illusion of separateness disappears. Disappears, and in a sense, the divinity within the human being does shine forth. We don't allow ourselves to see it enough. Um, did Hegel have something to say about that? All <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right, right. I told you that I would found a really neat Hegel. Um, let me pull it up here. Yeah. So this is from Hegel's Phenomenology of Spirit. And I hunted through multiple translations, and I finally found one, uh, the J.B. Bailey translation that I really like. So now think of this as the I and Thou, or the Manuel Levinas uh, ethos, because I think it'll help make sense of it. Or maybe just think of the Tao Te Ching. I mean, it's pretty poetic. It's pretty out there. Consciousness finds that it immediately is and is not another consciousness. This other is for itself only when it cancels itself as existing for itself and has self-existence only in the existence of another. Each is the mediating term to the other through which each mediates and unites itself with itself, and each is to itself and to the other an immediate self-existing reality, which, at the same time, exists for itself only through this mediation. They recognize themselves as mutually recognizing one another. Uh, now this I mean this is this is a w dance of words, mm -hmm. but maybe we should turn to Meister Eckhart, who said it much more simply when he said, "The eye by which I see God is the same eye by which God sees me, which I think gets right to the heart of it and and still gives you that sense of what? Because you always think that you're inside yourself looking out, but instead you're being pulled out of yourself somehow into the other, looking back. You recognize that you are you, but not only separated from you because you're also not really you unless the other person acknowledges that you are you. And so it's this dance, right? The dance of the seeing and being seen. Right? So now we see through a glass darkly, but then we shall see face to face. And so the real trajectory is n is not the, the immature path of keeping the projection out there and killing that projection of darkness. It's seeing mm -hmm. self in the other. Right. It's looking into the face mm -hmm. of the one you consider, the dark villainous criminal, and saying, I see myself in you. It's looking into the face of the one that you've called God and saying, I see myself in you. Being able to do that with both Jesus and Judas is what's required of Christians. I don't, I don't know if there's many Christians that, <laughs> that are doing that. That are up to that. themselves in Judas. I don't know that they're... Or Jesus. We've <clears throat> pretty much abandoned all hope of, of living to, up to that. <laughs> But we still crave it. We still like the idea that someone would do that for us, rather than mm. you know, we would just automatically be be saintly and innocent, mm -hmm. um, and not deal with the darkness of of the real human experience. Sometimes you encounter in love stories and in real life that wonderful case where the gaze of love does indeed prove transformative and the one who formerly would have done wrong changes because they have been seen as someone possessing a divine spark, right? And those are the, the love stories that we love to hear because the suggestion that such transformation is possible 
makes us remember the potentiality of human beings, that no one needs to live with the label they've been given. And sometimes it is our ability to perceive the goodness in someone that redeems them from acting out an archetype or stereotype of endless baubles, mishaps, misfortunes, ill deeds leading one to another to eternal darkness and damnation. <laughs> That's how Faust, the great Faust story ends. Faust has sold his soul to the devil and really should, you know, if they're going to make good on the contract, he needs to go down below. But because he has been seen and loved by the pure woman, heaven says, no, we're going to nullify that contract because she's seen the good in you. So we're going to, we're going to let you come in anyway. <laughs> So back to the conspiracy theorists. Conspiracy theory is just another name for old time religion. And if we can understand that that's what it is, that these are believers, this has nothing to do with facts, it has nothing to do with evidence. It's a belief system that is needed in times of great upheaval by those who are, are genuinely frightened and have to find a reason they have to find a cause and someone to blame, and they desperately need someone who can lead them out of that danger, right. some kind of messiah figure. And my contention is that this that's just not going to happen. I'm not sh I don't I don't really believe Jesus did that for us. <laughs> right. In in the Christian parable in the Christian world, and I don't believe that it's going to happen now. I mm -hmm. I I think that that this is a time that yes, there is a lot of corruption and darkness mm -hmm. and and evil that's in the world today and it's mm -hmm. up to all of us individually to take mm. up our office to do to take care of it <gasps> oh, and we actually okay. have to communicate with one another yeah. and 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 see see ourselves in the other in order to mm -hmm. transcend that otherness relationship which seems to be sort of the catalyst for all of this hatred and fear in the first place well what you've said, I mean, the focus on the individual reminds me that there is yet another psychological dynamic at work here, which is the very, one could call it primitive or just childlike belief that somebody's in charge. Yeah. Right? This, yeah. The myth of centrality, of, of an organized force behind things, uh, this is the, the perfect projection in religion. Well, God's in charge of everything. So right. this happened, it must be God's will, God's will. God, okay, well, the devil got in there somehow, but yeah, or you ultimately go, it's all going to work out because right, it's God's right, right. will. You even go back to the Greek myths and it's like, oh, well, the gods are the ones causing all of this mischief right. and terrible things to happen not to us. It's not our It's not our, it's our fate. It's it our was fate. just our fate. It was an ill fate born under a, a, a dark star. And, and if you look at all the, the Greek myth stories, though, it's like, it's like these... These guys were just having a little emotional spats between each other. And yes. Like, oh yeah, you like that person? Well, I'm going to kill that person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so gods just... and goddesses were behaving like very ill-mannered grown-ups. Yeah. <laughs> but they were gods, so they could right. do it and get away with it. <laughs> Christianity has also infantilized most of its believers with the continued insistence that we refer to God as Father, Father, Father keeps us chained into this notion that somebody else is in charge and will fix things. Mm. Um, there were some interesting research studies done in a very you know, less um, dangerous context that revealed that people universally have a very exalted idea about centralized power. They always misunderstood how much centralized power there actually was giving it much more credence than it deserved. The real truth is that there's very little centralized power. Agency happens locally. Things happen at the immediate level. Remember the great fall of the Berlin Wall when that story came out? Mm -hmm. The point was that it was a series of very innocent mishaps. A journalist asking some low-level government employee you know, was the wall going to be coming down and misunderstanding the reply to be, well, yes, and rather soon. And so the journalist immediately said, the wall's coming down. 
and the entire city ran out. The wall's coming down. And when you have that many thousands of East Germans running up and saying the wall's coming down, the guards just like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just, it was an insanity because for how many decades had the wall stood? And suddenly, without any central agency determining it, it all just crumbled because the will of the people <laughs> rose up. This is what we want. We'll take any opening, any opportunity, any hole in the dike and just pull the whole dike apart. Right. So essentially, we, we, we work in migration patterns like birds and, and buffalo. You know, it's like, it's like yeah. one, one person sort of steps into leadership position and all of a sudden we're all moving in this And they direction. don't even call it leadership. They might step out of line and the herd goes, oh, I guess that's the direction we're going now. Right. And everybody turns that direction and suddenly it's like, what are you guys doing following me, right? But that really is what following and yeah. leading kind of look like in real life. And sometimes it's just instinct, right? It's, it's not just e it's instinct. Not You're not even, even not thinking even about conscious. it. It's just like, oh, I, I don't know why I'm following. running this way. I just, Everybody's going this way, I started way, right? running this way. I, don't, I have no idea. Yeah. And yet everyone's like, well, it seems Tom like a good Hanks. way. Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks in the wonderful movie Forrest Gump. Mm. Remember? And he's running he's and running. running. Everybody's running after him. You know, where's he go? I don't know, but we're up. <laughs> Just kept it's running. Human beings, <laughs> <laughs> right? So the other, you know, core psychological, um, what should we call it, snarl behind conspiracy theories is this idea that if things are happening, it must be because of intentional agency, and that's not always true. And in fact, it's true far less of the time than what we'd like to believe. Yeah, and it, uh, that's where it's, it's, it's just laughable to me how the idea that these, these villains at the top are such geniuses that they were able to orchestrate all of these events um, flawlessly. You know, that they've basically mm -hmm. retained power by manipulation and, 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 you know, money and control for decades or centuries or millennia, <laughs> and no one's ever outed them. They've never, they, it's only through these t these little mm -hmm. channels where people are like, oh, I know what's really going on. It's like, but but no actual evidence. And it's like, <laughs> like the, the the idea that, that, that that's realistic, you know, seems, seems mm -hmm. just silly to me. Mm -hmm. And yet, it, at some level, that's what we want to believe. It's an archetypal. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a, it's like the myth wanting to come out through us and say, mm -hmm. "Yes, there is one Satan. There is one devil behind all of this. And if we just get rid of that one devil, mm -hmm. we will all be free." And that's a religion. Yeah, that's a religion. And as you know, you can't argue people out of their religion. That's the problem, which is why discussing conspiracy theory on Facebook is probably not the best environment for it. <laughs> because people simply want to convert you. They don't want to be unconvinced. They want to convert you. That's what religious believers do. They have no opening place in their mind for actual conversation of the level that you're talking because about. Because the emotions have already clamped down. The emotional mm -hmm. need mm -hmm. for this savior and a vindication or a, you know, wake mm -hmm. up like me, be awake like me, because mm -hmm. I have the real truth. Like, that's that's solidified like this. It's like, to, for mm -hmm. them to let go of it now would be even more painful, because then they'd have to mm -hmm. sh feel their doubt again. They'd have mm -hmm. to feel... The insecurity of not being a believer. Yeah. And that's very scary indeed. It is. Especially when you haven't experienced it for a while because you've been so damn sure about yourself mm -hmm. for, de right. for years. <laughs> well, I experienced that very feeling last week when I started reading the articles about the non-replicability of so many scientific experiments. Because I've been a believer in the scientific method. You know, I go to Google Scholar, I look for peer-reviewed that have lots of citations and you know lots and lots of people have been studying this and we've done the meta analysis and we've cross referenced and we've got our statistics uh -huh. you feel very powerful like marching with a good strong army of thinkers here <laughs> and then 
Somebody suggested, why don't you try replicating some of these studies, and less than 40% could be replicated, meaning they got different results when they ran these various research studies. It's very discouraging, even more than discouraging. It begins to pull the foundations out. Like, well, is it okay for me to say that this has a 35% validity or can I not say that anymore because I don't know if that 35% is based on built on straw basically right. it's a mudslide and out you, there you said too that a lot of experiments that are conducted are done in, you know, within the college culture so right. which is not the right environment it's not the right environment right because you're asking people down the hall and you've only found 64 of your chums at the university willing to do it, and it's just a small sample and it's not representative. So a lot of of what we've been taking for granted as part of our religious foundation is being called into question, and it's very disconcerting, yeah. because now what do you point to? Now where's your authority? Yeah. Where, what do you believe when you've got mm-hmm. very little basis mm-hmm. for belief? Right. Do you, you go back to anecdotal evidence? You know, personal stories, hunches. Right. I, I'll say for me, I, I, tr- I try to use a lot of different tactics, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure I, I get there. Mm-hmm. I'm often in self-doubt, um, deliberately or not deliberately. I often am questioning what I think I know. Mm-hmm. I've got the emotional desire to, to, to solve, to be done. Got mm-hmm. it. I got it right. No, no, no more need for thinking about this. Mm-hmm. That's what I want, but I mm-hmm. don't do that. I'm mm-hmm. used to going, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> what have I really got here? Mm-hmm. And so I like, to, I like to look for patterns that match. Mm-hmm. When I see his, history, and I don't mean like a, a, you know, a really vague oversimplification of a historical account but when I've like done some deep research mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and you know and like this is the this is sort of detailed history from first hand accounts mm-hmm. like here's the, the the historian is bringing in mm-hmm, all these quotes mm-hmm. or these um you know d- the journal entries the logs from the captain or whatever like all these different specific details and you're like wow so that's how it really went down and it has nothing to do with the legend it's like it's like it's like, it's like the legend you can mm-hmm. see is, is loosely loosely strung around <laughs> that, and usually is the opposite mm-hmm. of what really happened. Mm-hmm. You know, um, when you get that level of history in a number of different areas, mm-hmm. and you start to see the pattern matching yeah. over and over again, then you would expect the pattern to sort of be similar to that mm-hmm. in the next situation, as long as you can see it's apples to apples comparison. Right. And so when you see a messiah complex rising mm-hmm. in the culture for example mm-hmm. and all of a sudden as you said jung jung had basically could could predict predicted it. the holocaust you yeah. get the nazi party mm-hmm. because people mm-hmm. just they just want purity mm-hmm. and if they've chosen a group to to be the scapegoat mm-hmm. they will they will they will happily make that sacrifice to feel like they appear again. Mm-hmm. And so when you see that happening and then you see another Messiah complex brew, you know, bubbling up in your culture today, mm-hmm. I think the same yeah. red flags yeah, and yeah, warnings yeah, yeah. should come up and go, oh, yeah. wait a minute, <laughs> before anyone, right. before anyone mm-hmm. calls for a, a mm-hmm. mob lynching or some sort of, you know... Mm-hmm mass uh, extermination of these evil people that we think are at the top mm-hmm. of the power pyramid let's get some facts please mm-hmm. get let's get the facts and I just I, mm-hmm. I, I, I don't want to marginalize every, anybody because I feel like everyone's part of this grand organism we call a, a human species you know everyone's mm-hmm. got a role and it's valuable and the mm-hmm. conspiracy theorists they're, they've got a role too and they're poking at stuff, and sometimes they poke at something that mm-hmm. needs to be poked at. It's like, ah, you got you got something there. You're, you know, I don't believe the whole story that you want to you want to filter it into, but I do think that you're right to poke at that. And thank goodness we're waking up mm-hmm. to that the, the, to that mm-hmm. lie within our culture or whatever. Mm-hmm. But let's let's not give you guys the guns <laughs> to start enacting justice when it, when your story is essentially a myth rising up through your insecurities mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and and not founded in reality and the rest yeah. of us do not agree with your yeah. with your facts right so that that brings us back to where we started this conversation which was that idea of a shared consensual reality and how nervous it makes us when we see a group of people standing outside 
that consensual reality and reenacting a pattern that we recognize all too well. Yeah. With an identifiable scapegoat victim, Rothschilds, i.e. the Jewish people, who have been targeted again and again and again. And so it does require people to say, not again, never again. We call you on that. You may not have that religious belief enacted in this culture. You may go ahead believing it, if that makes you feel better, but you may not bring that and announce it as the directive mythology of this culture. Because, yeah, it's, it's invalid, it's inhumane, and it lets you off the hook. It lets everybody off the hook to invent redeemers and villains. And it's like the, the, the witch trials, you know? It's like, no, no, no one got rid of any real witches mm-hmm. during that period, any real evil. Mm-hmm. It was a bunch of people dying for no reason. Mm-hmm. A lot of women dying mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. no reason. Yeah. Just to make people feel better about themselves. Yeah, as the Holocaust was a hell of a lot of Jewish people dying for no reason except to make the German Aryan race feel that it was getting purer somehow. Well, Germans have now fully recognized their complicity right. in that horror. And you know, the, the blood on their hands has not gone away in three generations. They're still dealing with the after. But I'm afraid that. America has n- American culture has never truly faced our demons. No, we haven't. We're we're still not willing to take responsibility mm-hmm. for our treatment of the Native American yeah. Indians. Yeah, I think we're more ripe for a Holocaust like situation than than many other countries we're 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 ready for it because, because we still yeah, want to believe we think in we're our the good purity guy. we yes. really do we really really have a false belief that we're the good guy captain america yeah we believe we are captain america and can do no wrong yeah. and we're not the most evil <laughs> we're not the most evil country to ever well, some people earth. might disagree. <laughs> some, some people might see it that way. I mean, we've been fairly We're right up there with Paul Pot. We've been fairly p- imperialistic in the last century, you know. Pot Paul, Paul Pot. And then there's and then there's the slavery, which which was growing in America d- during a time when most of the world was b- abolishing it. You know, so they, there's there's some dark, very dark chapters mm-hmm. to our history. And I think you know, yeah, we need to really confront it. But I think it it takes emotional maturity. Mm-hmm. It ta- it really takes. It's easy to say, oh, we, you know, there's a shadow we need to, mm-hmm. we need to embrace. It's like, yeah, but how do you do that? Mm-hmm. And I think it, 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 it's shadow work. It's it's being willing to see mm-hmm. the disgusting in yourself. It's willing to see the right. darkness in you and just sit with that. And mm-hmm. I feel like the mm-hmm. George Floyd mm-hmm. stuff really mm-hmm. did that, you know. And I, I, when I watched the George Floyd video, of course, I identified with George Floyd. And identified mm-hmm. with the with the passers mm-hmm. by who were furious and mm-hmm. and like like wanting to move mm-hmm. in on that cop and stop him. Mm-hmm. But I but but being a white man, I could also I could also and uh, very uncomfortably choose to identify with that cop mm-hmm. who killed him mm-hmm. and and feel that mm-hmm. um, and accept that that I that we are all mm-hmm. of this. That mm-hmm. This is. And at a very literal level, you know, we're all accomplice to that. When we're mm-hmm. when we're supporting a society where that kind of evil is still happening on a regular basis, mm-hmm. we're we're and we're not we're not doing anything yeah. about it. We are condoning that. We are we are accomplice. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the this desire, this this un this queasiness that we feel. Um, and I would say I feel as a, as a white man, I feel as the queasiness sort of comes up when the word racism is even spoken because I know <laughs> that mm-hmm. I'm the likely target for mm-hmm. that word mm-hmm. because I'm a white man, because historically mm-hmm. um, people like me have done most of the damage in this country mm-hmm. to people of color. And so I get, I, I instinctually get a little tense and, and I'm, so for someone for, to call me racist really upsets me because I've done so much work on that mm-hmm. issue. I've researched so much. I've talked to so many people. You know, I've mm-hmm. gone to a racism facilitation training. Like I've done lots of work on this. So mm-hmm. it's, it's like, oh, how dare you <laughs> call me racist? Mm-hmm. But that's the same thing again. If this, I am mm-hmm. unwilling to take on the shadow that is me mm-hmm. and my and my people. Mm-hmm. 
and at some level though it's it needs to move past the the blaming and shaming of implicit bias and i'm not saying that's not an important step in the movement but i'm reminded of a very tart and unexpected conversation i had with my jewish agent who was at the time for 12 years she acted as the agent for me and my performing partner Peggy Lipschutz putting us into schools to do school programs in Chicago and she encouraged us to design a program on the Holocaust because the state of Illinois had mandated Holocaust education prior to graduating from high school so Peggy and I worked for months and months on this Holocaust program and it was going very well and at one point um, I said to our agent, I, you know, I just want to thank you for all of your supportive efforts and work on our behalf. I think the program is going well. I think we're really changing how the children feel about the Jewish people. And she gave me this strange look, kind of a little smile, and she sat back and she said, I think I know you well enough to say this. I don't give a damn how the children feel about Jewish people. I want to make sure there are strong laws and the willingness to enforce them. And she was talking about the laws against anti-Semitic behavior. Mm -hmm. So there's a difference between how people feel and the behavior that is tolerated in a society. And what she was expressing was the more people that know about this horrendous thing and sign a commitment never again those are the ones who will be willing to pressure their legislators to make sure that laws are passed to protect the minorities and the outsiders against becoming the scapegoats Mm -hmm. that get strung up when things are not going well. So it's the behaviors that I think we need to focus on. I I disagree because when it comes to racism in America it's not to say that the legislation has done nothing, but it has not done the trick, and it doesn't do the trick. You see not the an- by itself the, anti- alone, the no. anti-Semitism is still an issue, mm-hmm. too, mm-hmm. and homophobia, and all these things are still mm-hmm. real issues, and I think it's because of the psychological issue mm-hmm. of seeing the other as yourself it has to actually be done. It does, but don't you see how they go hand in hand? The homophobia... You know, issue got this huge, you know, watershed shift when the law actually got in advance of the public psychology, and we got the gay marriage rights sooner than anybody had believed it would be possible, mm-hmm. because there was still so many Americans who were opposed to homosexuality on religious or moral or ethical or whatever grounds. Yeah. So in that sense, the law forced people to confront their homophobia and move the psychological piece forward. Mm -hmm. So, no, law doesn't change minds, but it changes the climate in which minds form opinions, which is why it's so important. So you have law, you have the, the implicit or deep psychological or unconscious, and then you have the conscious and the behavioral. So all of those pieces work together in this kind of interesting, lurching way that society moves forward. Yeah. So what I think the real problem is with conspiracy theories is that they take attention away from the real problems we have. Mm. Emotionally, they're right. They're right on the money that there's corruption, there's deception. We don't know what the truth is anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have major problems that need to be handled, but instead of, of going after the real problems... We're, 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 we're pitching them at somebody else. We're saying, oh, they're, 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 it's an evil cabal of, of, of masterminds that are behind all of this. Mm-hmm. If we could just get rid of them, it would all be done. But that's not true. We have real racism in this country. Mm-hmm. We have real police brutality. We have real misinformation problems. We have, we have real leadership problems. You know, we, we, we have a government that we don't trust. Most of us mm-hmm. do want a revolution mm-hmm. of some sort. We don't want a bloody one, but there's a... You know, rather than pretending we're going to somehow overthrow the establishment in some sort of mythical symbolism, we need to actually reform the establishment. Mm-hmm. 
we actually need to the culture is is broken in a way the culture mm-hmm. is is in this weird place of of disconnect mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. with 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 capitalism being our our pure mm-hmm. holy saint and socialism being the devil and it's like these are things we have to come to grips with because our country currently is not that dichotomous we are a mm-hmm. socialistic Republic, you know, there's a lot mm-hmm. of socialism already in this country, and it's not mm-hmm. evil. Some of it's mm-hmm. inefficient for sure, and needs to be examined. But but if we just mm-hmm. dump it all into the evil category, then to these black and white dichotomies, we cannot even talk about what needs to be talked about. Mm-hmm. It, it misses the boat. Right. So, when you're describing the conspiracy theory and it taking us away from the real needs of the times, which are a deeper analysis as to the real structural problems, you're also describing why it is that in sort of the Western scientific mindset, we were very dismissive of so-called primitive societies and their superstitions, because they would make up stories about why people get sick because they didn't know about germs. So conspiracy theorists make up stories because they seem to lack the tools to study what's actually there or what we consider to be actually behind the the disturbing elements in our society that we don't like. So, you know, rather than calling them merely superstitious, let's just look at the issue of have we given our citizens the necessary tools to look at what's really there. Why would they have to leap to these superstitious beliefs about Rothschild conspiracies and invisible King Johns who will take over and save us? How could we have deprived our people of such necessary tools of cognition (laughs) that they, they don't know how to go about figuring out what's really wrong, what's really broken. Yeah, or maybe we really are too frightened at an emotional level to confront the real problems because they're just that big and scary. The environment. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, po- uh, population growth. You know, it's like, and I, I see these conspiracy mm-hmm. theorists making making this the issue is like oh bill gates is a is a you know he's a eugenicist and he wants to call the the human population he's evil you know it's like but isn't that <laughs> isn't that something most of us are talking about is yeah. is unsustainable population growth for human beings isn't that isn't mm-hmm. that a topic that we do need to discuss mm-hmm. you know it's not something where we're like oh we're going to call the the poor people or mm-hmm. we're going to call all the rich people we're like that's that's inhumane of course but but mm-hmm. why are we not even willing to have that conversation? Is it too scary? Mm-hmm. And that's why that's why that's not the con- the, the real conversation isn't happening, and mm-hmm. that's why the conspiracy theories are instead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, conspiracy theories are easier. They're sexier. You can get more worked up about them. They're easier to describe because what you're really talking about are wicked problems. Yeah. I love that phrase. That was just a, a genius phrase. Wicked problems are those which have so many intertwining pieces that it's almost impossible to to speak from one end to the other in a direct line because you keep having to integrate yet another piece into it. So before long, you've just got this huge mass of thorny issues that are all gathering around you. Yeah, but even wicked problems can be discussed. And if you have enough people who can breathe sitting around a table and everybody grabs hold of one of the the thorny, you know, vines and starts to pull it a little bit so you can see where they're tangled, you can figure things out. But it requires enormous effort and a kind of stubborn optimism, Mm. to use another favorite phrase of mine from the, the woman who heads up the uh, climate change initiative at the UN who who said, you know, I I have to have this stubborn optimism or I throw up my hands and walk away. You just have to decide this is it. I'm in it for the long haul. I may never see it in my lifetime, but I'm not giving up. Never giving up. So I think that's the only proper attitude is just to say, yeah, it's a real shit show, but it's our show. 
and we're not giving up. Yeah. Time to dig in. Yeah. <laughs> Time to be willing to lick those those pus, lick your wounds. pussy wounds mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and stomach it. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>